extra extra read all about it. Welcome to the Empire's Recap, and today we will be going over the chaos and drama of our somewhat respected rulers. This week's unlucky number 13 comes into play. Emperor number 13 is Ollie the Orion Sound. He brings with him song, enthusiasm, and a better understanding of the SMP multiverse. Back where it all started, in Afterlife. Ollie finishes his fight with the fisherman, and Zeus accidentally kills him. He explores around Afterlife and makes a chilling discovery. Nobody's there. He's living in a ghost town. Celebrating being the last one standing, he eventually gets lonely and makes a plan to ascend to the heavens and bring back Sausage. He meets God, otherwise known as Pearlescent Moon, and when Pearl tells him Sausage is asleep, but she wouldn't mind if Ollie stayed, he decides he'd rather be alive, thanks, and falls off the edge of the heaven cloud base thing. He finds himself alone in a place he doesn't recognize, and since he can't get home, he just starts playing single player. He finds the Ollie Pelago to build his base, and explores the land around to gain riches and loot. He stumbles across a dark section of the mangrove, and decides to get the hell out of there when the frogs start to talk. The world is his oyster, and he fights with pillagers around a strange looking campfire. He causes chaos in a nearby village, and climbs a mountain, where he gains a mountain dog he calls Sausage, after an old friend, and names Base Camp Alpha. There are still dangers around, although Ollie has his new companion to help him, and he falls in powdered snow and then a massive cave. The water drags him down to an ancient city, where he loots and leaves nice signs for the warden. In his greed, he stops pressing shift and the warden arises, where Sausage, the dog, dies. Ollie gets out alive and creates a grave for his dog back at the base. A dolphin takes him back to the Olipelago, and after a musical number, he sets his sights on the Ender Dragon. Who can help him in this endeavor? Calling up some speedrunners, Cryptic Zeus answers the call. With no time to listen, Zeus directs Ollie through the nether. Ollie, of course, decides he loves his new strider and drags it to the overworld with him where it nearly dies. He loses it in the care of some villagers while he continues on his quest. He finds his way to the stronghold, breaking the first rule of Minecraft and almost dying to lava. That's unrelated to digging straight down. Zeus has to leave just as Ollie gets to the end, so he ventures forth alone. He does it. Congrats to him. He's so much more these days, with an egg as proof of his victory. He spends two months in the end credits and comes back at the campfire with a massive bridge that definitely wasn't there before. Attempting to go home, he comes across a few signs telling him the way to dawn. He arrives in this new place thinking the village worships him and sings the second musical number of the video, soon to be interrupted by Jen. She doesn't seem to remember him, but at least she agrees to try and get help him get home. She shows him her docks, and blocks break under him to fall down into the deep dark. Well, he ends up in the goblin's cage right above it, actually. The tale of the unlucky 13th Empire ends here for today, and we'll hopefully see him in a month. Tipped off by a phone call from Lizzie, Jem realizes that there are many lost bees she can rescue. Thus, she decides to build a bee sanctuary. But before she begins, a horn call from her tavern alerts her to a new bard in town. This mysterious man somehow seems to know her, and she tries to help him find his way home before he's swallowed up by the ground. Look, here's the docks right here. Now if you take that boat over there, you should be able to take it along the coast and find a place to land. It'd be perfect. Oh, ah! Uh. You saw nothing. Ignoring that oddball, she chops down a mangrove tree blocking her way and begins building a greenhouse, soon aptly renamed the Yellow House. It was the wrong color for Dawn anyways. Sausage comes flying by and she trades him some honeycomb for some leaves and plants to decorate the bee sanctuary, making sure he has plenty of food before he leaves. For a final touch, she builds a tree in the middle of the Yellow House, filling it up and making a great home for the bees. On the other end of that phone call is Lizzie, the mayor of Animalia. But a mayor can't rule a ghost town. She needs villagers, and what better profession than a butcher for foxes? Stewie, a proud plant dad, is the first to bring life to this town, with no suspicious things under the butcher shop whatsoever. Sadly, Lizzie has to go mining after using all of her resources on festive banners and more. We kind of saw this coming since episode two, and everything goes absolutely fine on this trip. Help. Oh no. Oh, things have gone horribly wrong. <coughs> Everything's fine. I have this under control. Twelve seconds later. Ah, much better. Oh, gosh, no. Worse, worse. 
Why does everything want to kill me today? She gets back to the surface with 32 diamonds and finally gets the Silk Touch enchantment she's been looking for. After Silk touching almost all the ores, her bundle is almost complete. She makes a giant amethyst crystal surrounding a bell in the center of the town for the villagers to gather around at nighttime. She takes to decorating their houses with red vines for some color, and this time we can assure you it's not corruption. The villagers roam freely and add more life into Critter City, with streetlights and houses fully furnished. But unknown to her, the villagers aren't the only ones roaming free in her village, thanks to Fwip. Fwip begins his episode by finishing the tunnel he made to dawn. It took several hours, and as it's getting dark, he decides to head over to the tavern. Or he would have, had he not overheard some talking between Jam and this weird bard man. The guy even confessed to stealing Fwip's loot from the deep dark. Fwip kidnaps the guy from Dawn and puts his first law disrespecter inside a cage. He needs to tell the sheriff about this one. Fwip makes a stop at his LA cage and brings one with him as a gift for the sheriff. And maybe a little prank too. Unfortunately though, he forgets to tell the sheriff about the lawbreaker, and so has to make the journey to Tumbletown to leave some signs. He takes a trip down the Great Bridge for some materials from the Sanctuary's outpost too. He journeys to the Evermore to make a deal for mangrove roots, and when he gets back to Goblands, he properly organises his storage system, just in time for his new tavern build. He builds up the interior of the build, and then takes a quick prank break to team up with Pix and bring a warden to Stratus. This was a ploy, of course, to collect the head of the beast. Whip spends some time building up the outside of his tavern, including a small house nearby as a gift for the sheriff. Speak of the devil, the sheriff turns up in Goblins with a deputy badge, and sees the house that Fwip made him, with a great view of the guy in the cage. Respectful tunnel digging time! Fwip digs out a tunnel in a basement to Animalia that he decorates so it will hopefully cause less suspicion. Despite his recent pranks on Joel, he still delivers some gifts to Stratos, in the hopes of still being friends with the god. And now it's time to talk about Fwip's co-conspirator Pix. With the new empire on the server, Pix wonders if the Twelve Towered Great Bridge will need an update, but he hasn't got time for that right now. He's been so busy helping other people with their shenanigans that he hardly has time for any of his own. Not that he can show us, anyways. He's been all over the world this past week, starting from his view of the now infamous Warden incident. Pix claims neutrality, even after helping Fwip get the beast into Joel's kingdom, and that could be real. Leave it to the archaeologist to be ecstatic over finally being able to see the Warden in good lighting. Oh, I'm, I'm Where's Fwip? I'm neutral in this. Uh, he's, he's brought you a friend. After that's done, he goes back to being a delivery man. His first stop is bringing Joey some materials to repair his god-damaged pier, in exchange for some of the local delicacies. A quick stop back home to trade Lizzie frog lights for her amethyst, if the seller can actually bring herself to part with them, and it's back out again. Sausage needs an allay to manage his tavern, and Pix has just the little fella. <laughs> this guy's gotta be the general manager, he's such an airhead. <laughs> I think he'll- Oh yeah, yeah! He's perfect! His final visit is Catherine, stopping by her empire to pick up the wool owed for her froglight order and to politely ignore any curses going on. He lives in a tomb. The dark castle looks fine to him. Sausage begins this episode by delivering a bouquet of his finest wood to Scott. But while heading back to his empire, he finds a base camp high up in the mountains with a grave for himself. Existential, right? I wonder who put that there, because surely he wouldn't know if he was dead. Back at home, he meets with his fishy neighbor, Joey, where they argue about skeletons and flags. Soon enough, he heads off to the nether, and as he was at the portal, he saw his son. Flying over to Joel's base to deliver Hermes back, he helps defeat a warden down on the ground that Flip let loose to kill a god. Back in Sanctuary, Shovel visits to ask for help with making a banner for Evermore. After a couple iterations, they have the perfect one. To round off the episode, he builds a massive windmill to look over his new crop fields, as Sanctuary is growing too fast for the small ones he had at first. For something as simple as getting her own banner, Shelby has a lot of, perhaps, unhonest work for the design. Welcome to the Forgotten Cove! Oh yeah, I totally forgot about it. First taking a visit to a friend Pirate Joe to request a creeper head for it, but Joey's prices are a little on the expensive side, and she's mm, already a criminal, right? She does a little unauthorized borrowing of his trident, and then heads to spawn to use the magic fire to summon thunder. She spends the storm striking down creepers, and then eventually gets ahead she can take to Sausage. She wanders over the Great Bridge and takes refuge to get out of the rain before heading over to Sanctuary to get her banner. Another mysterious sign shows up in the Evermore, in the same place as the last. Sausage did say he saw a ghost, could it be them? Though, 
Why would the ghost be leaving signs saying, they're coming for you, is anyone's guess? She gets attacked and tries to threaten the thing shooting her, but she can't find them and ends up looking a little crazy to Scott when he drops by for some potions. The ominous noises do not stop. Shriekers and potion drinking and footsteps make the mangrove wood feel a lot less safe. Whip travels Drew and she questions him about ghosts on the server. He would definitely hear any ghosts with his super hearing. She distracts herself with making a broom so she can visit the other empires around here and get out alive when she has to venture further into the woods. One of those empires is Chromia, where infrastructure is the name of the game this week. One of Chromia's main building materials is the Netherwoods, but unfortunately, the only portal nearby belongs to the god next door. Scott time lasts himself, building a very colorful portal to give him better access to the Nether. Scott invites Flip up from his dwelling underground to trade some rocks with him so he can build up proper pathways in Chromia. Little suspicious of the gift of pork though. Mr. Mythical Sausage comes by to trade him some of the wood he needs for some builds in the future. It's always good to see them getting along. In exchange for his fedora from Catherine, Scott is trading her some dye, but in an unusual way. He did say this would be eccentric. It's rather funny Catherine decided to put a feather in his new fedora, as his dad used to have a feather in his hat. I wonder if he called him macaroni. Talking of this fine work in haberdashery, this week, Catherine wants to rebuild the Glimmergrove Castle, but it turns out that it's a bit harder to do when she's getting distracted anytime she starts rebuilding. First, she sews up Scott's new hat, and in return, she gets the dice she asked for. However, Scott decided to make it a game, hiding the dice all over, and on top of, his house. Once she finds the dice, she travels to enlist the fairies to help her gather materials before laying down the foundations of the castle. However, as she finishes the base, she hears a noise, leading to her meeting Pirate Joe, who has discovered love at first sight. Someone please teach this pirate how to flirt. Thank you for not stealing from me. You're welcome. D did you did you need something? Yes, you. Me. Yes, you. I'm in love with you. What do you mean you're in love with me? I don't even know who you are. I told you I'm Pirate Joe. We're pirates <laughs> together. We belong together. You're my princess. Turning back to her project, she realizes that part of her castle is being corrupted. Oh dear. But this is no time for moping, so she continues to rebuild until one Pirate Joe makes an entrance again. This time, he returns with a gift. I wonder where he got so much gold. She politely pushes him away to finish the castle, ignoring the darker, lightless side. It's been quite a week for Pirate Joe. Let's start at the top. He pays a visit to Sanctuary to grill Sausage about the banner he left for Joey, the symbol of his enemy, Skeletron, really? Joey actually likes the banner, but the guilt trip is a nice excuse to get his elytra enchanted for free, and to see where Sausage stores all his goodies. He wants to put the banner question to rest once and for all, so Joey heads to the magic campfire at the center of Spawn and summons a thunderstorm with it. That would have been helpful during last week's waiting, but hindsight's always crystal clear. With his mighty trident, he finally gets hold of the right kind of head, makes the pattern, and presents the official banner of Eversea. The power of the trident is mighty, and is Joey's alone, much to Shelby's dismay when she comes asking to borrow it. All this creeper hunting has kept him in one place for too long, so Joey sets to sea, purely for adventure. He finds a trail of lanterns that leads him to the most beautiful pirate princess he's ever seen, and Joey is instantly smitten. Catherine is not a pirate, but I'm not telling Joey that. <coughs> To win her favor and her hand, he needs gold, and he knows just where to get it. Seems some fool of a god is just leaving a giant ball of gold out in the open, like he wants it to get taken. The gold doesn't win him Catherine's heart, but he's determined to keep trying. He'll steal from anyone and everyone to please his pirate princess. However, it seems that his latest theft has already been noticed. Joey wakes up on the newly destroyed dock, staring at the ruins of the Ender Pearl. His sheep have been redyed, there is skulk spreading through his land, and everything that hadn't been moved into the chest room is gone, including his trident. The note in the wreckage says that Sir Piggles is held at ransom for return of the stolen gold. Well, Joey isn't going to take this lying down. With the help of a few favors from others not fond of the Flying Menace, he rebuilds Forgotten Cove's shoreline into a more defensible and aesthetic battlement, complete with functioning cannons and a massive harpoon gun. If this means war, this means war! Joey sneaks into Stratos and, knowing that pigs can't fly, finds Sir Piggles trapped in the village below. He returns the Stratosphere at a more appropriate size. The two of them make their escape across the Great Bridge, and after raiding the Sanctuary Outpost, make it back home safe, sound, and scheming. Just in time to greet Shelby, who has returned with his trident? Apparently, she'd stolen it before the ship got destroyed to get herself a creeper pattern, 
and enchanted it before returning it to be more fitting of its proper master. Joey admits respect for her thievery and her magic, making a useful ally as things threaten to escalate. Who better to take on a god of the air than a god of the sea? Oblivious to the plots of some lowly pirate, Joel starts his week off swell by mining glass for an hour and a half, originally accusing Jimmy of it until he reads the sign, declaring the perpetrator to be Pixel. In revenge, he decides to shrink wrap the mountain he got the calcite from, but not before getting caught by the historian himself. However, this is not the only prank he's been victim of, as someone has also waxed his copper. This isn't even the worst of it, as someone has stolen the stratosphere. Luckily, he has Hermes there to give him some raw gold to soften the blow. He's sent back to Sausage with some netherite to match the worth of the past gifts. He also starts on a new section of Stratos, Upper Stratos. Very clever, Joel. However, he needs to focus on the stolen stratosphere, which was revealed to be stolen by our local pirate, Joey. I mean, what did we expect? Thus, revenge is in order. He pignaps Sir Piggles and leaves Joey an explosive surprise. Now that that's out of the way, he can start on a brand new island, building the farm first this time. The newly named Moss Island is built up around the farm, but doesn't have a building just yet. Before he can start gathering the materials, he sees something has been left in place of the stratosphere, a tiny gold block. Not a very good replacement if you ask me. He pushes it to the side instead to finish his build, gathering materials and becoming a material girl. But look! Materials! Woo! Material girl! No, it's material god, actually. I think material Joel would have worked better than mate. He finishes off his build before turning to find Hermes has brought back a new goat horn. Bit of a frosted side for the sheriff this week with another noise machine. This time with a complaint letter. And Fripp has recently arrested someone for disrespecting the law, although his deputy number two is on thin ice at the moment for a small prank. Unrelated, did you know the advancement You've Got a Friend in Me is based off of Woody from Toy Story? It's time to build a jail. He visits Sausage for some wood and gets back to Tumble Town to time lapse the making of a jail. Every person that gets arrested is going to have a file made with their name and what their crime was to lend them in the obsidian box. Deputy Norman is running the jail. The law we can trust. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, it is time to arrest a god. He calls Joel to tumble town and takes him to the jail. Joel puts away his staff as Jimmy signs him in and locks him away. Unfortunately, Joel has the time and determination in his hand and just punches his way through a door while Jimmy panics. Not the most successful arrest I've ever seen. Following up on the message Fripp left him, Jimmy flies on over to the Goblins with a brand new deputy badge. Fripp is of course delighted by this and shows off his latest build, a home for the sheriff. There's a balcony looking over the whole cave, including a caged man staring at them. Strange. Join us next week for more chaos and shenanigans. Thank you for watching and thanks to everyone for helping out with the project. Check them all out below.